good races in the struggle for life. And if you want to know what Darwin meant by that, then you go to his next book called The Descent of Man. And then he makes it very, very clear, because this picture here really does represent what Darwin taught, that there are different races of people, some closer to ape-like ancestors than others. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong here. I am not blaming evolution for racist attitudes, but can you see, for people who believe in Darwinian evolution, how that could fuel or engender racism? Can you see that? Because if some races are inferior to others, others are more superior, can't you see some could look down on others? And that's exactly what happened in history. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould from Harvard University uh, said this. He said, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. And that's exactly what happened. See, evolution is not the cause of racism. You know what the cause of racism is? I mean, evolution is not the cause of abortion. Evolution is not the cause of homosexual behavior. Ultimately, it's what? Sin, exactly. But Darwinian evolution fuels racism. And the more people are taught Darwinian evolution or taught there's no God, then you can see how they could then justify racism or justify homosexual behavior or abortion or whatever they want. And sadly, let me show you how this played out in history. Did you know that in 1924, the New York Tribune newspaper published an article, The Missing Links Found in Australia. You know, you know who the missing links were? The Australian Aborigines. And in fact, it is a sad part of Australia's history, well documented in the secular world, that scientists from Germany and England, other places, America, sent people to Australia. They paid property owners to go on their property. They herded the Aborigines into swamps or over cliffs to kill them, men, women, and children. They shot them. They had instructions on how to boil up their skulls, how to skin them for specimens for museums around the world. Five to 10,000 Aboriginal graves were desecrated, all in the name of evolution. Pretty sad, isn't it? Now, let me tell you something about your own history here. Did you know in 1904, Otto Benga, pygmy from South Africa, was brought over to America for the World's Fair. And instead of taking him back to his own country, the explorer and the director of the Bronx Zoo did a deal together because of their belief in evolution. And that is well documented. In our book, One Blood, we have a whole chapter dedicated to Otto Benga. It's a very sad part of American history. In fact, there was a book written called The Pygmy in the Zoo. And we document in there that because of their evolutionary beliefs, they put Otto Benga in a cage with an orangutan called the Monkey Cage. It became the most popular exhibit at the Bronx Zoo, and Americans lined up in long lines on weekend to show their children the relationship between the pygmy and uh, the orangutan. What do you think that was doing to children's thinking in America? Not only that, do you know that in colleges across America and other parts of the world, students were reading statements like this. For instance, Scientific American. You've heard of Scientific American, haven't you? You find it in the newsstands. Did you know that back in 1907, they talked about the pygmies, the Congo pygmies, being ape-like, elfish creatures? And then you had a book called The History of Creation, which was studied as a textbook in many universities in America. In fact, students even from church homes were studying these sorts of books. Who remembers being taught at school? Embryonic recapitulation, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Do you remember that? <laughs> well, let me put it another way. How many of you remember being taught that when an embryo develops in its mother's womb, it goes through a fish stage with gill slits till it becomes human. Who remembers being taught that? Oh, okay. Who remembers seeing pictures like this in their textbook? Remember those, those embryo pictures? And you look at them and say, oh, look how similar they are. You know, here we have uh, the, these different um, animals here, and we have man, and look how similar the embryos are. Did you know that those pictures are still in most public school textbooks in America and other parts of the world today, and yet the man who popularized this, called Ernst Haeckel, who wrote this book called The History of Creationism, doctored his diagram, it's a well-known fraud. A doctor in England, uh, not that long ago, in fact, did some work, and he showed that that arrow there points to Haeckel's original diagrams, and so he went and looked at the actual embryos themselves, and when you look at them, here is what they look like. The, the fraud, it was absolutely startling. What Haeckel did, and admitted he did, he used the same basic wood carving uh, diagrams of the embryos because he wanted to believe in evolution. He believed it was true. And, and, and the public was sucked in. What gets me is this has been known to be a fraud for 40, 50 years or more. It's still in most public school textbooks. It's incredible. Well, Haeckel published a book called The History of Creation. Here are some of the statements from Haeckel's book. I hate to even read these to you. I'm sorry to read these to you. I'm embarrassed to read these to you. But I want you to know what people were learning in colleges and universities across America and other parts of the world. Imagine generations in America learning this. At the lowest stage of human mental development, the Australian Aborigines, Polynesians, and, and, and so on, the, the uh, uh, ne Negro, and it, uh, very, very sad uh, what they were learning there. And then we go on to some of the other statements that he has. 
Uh, I consider the Negro to be a lower species of man, cannot make, him, uh, make up my mind to look upon him as a man and a brother, for the gorilla would have to be admitted into the family, according to some English traveller he quoted in that particular book. Or here we have, uh, uh, he has a, an account of a missionary, Morlang, who supposedly uh, tried to, s without success, to civilize the ape-like Negro tribes. They stand far below unreasoning animals. Can you imagine generations of students in America learning that sort of thing? Isn't that mind-blowing? Now, here's an interesting quote. I want you to look at this. Do you know where this quote comes from? It comes from the biology textbook used by John Scopes and others at the time of the Scopes trial. Now, evolutionists don't often tell you about this, but here is the textbook that was teaching evolution and so on in the public schools at that time, the very one that John Scopes purportedly used, and said this, there are five races or varieties of man. There's the Negro type, brown race, American Indian, Mongolo, Mon Mon Mongolian or yellow race. And then I want you to have a look at this last statement here, because uh, this is very, very telling, this last statement here. And finally, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. You imagine whole generations coming through a public education system in America from the public schools, learning that those who are, who are Americans, uh, the Caucasians and Americans, were part of the highest race of all. What do you think that would do in regard to their views on others? Pretty sad, isn't it? You know, I'm going to challenge us here. I'm going to say this. I believe the church should get rid of the term races. You see, at, at the time of Thomas Jefferson, for instance, when people talked about races, by and large it was the English race, the Irish race, that sort of thing. But evolution, Darwinian evolution, has so permeated our thinking that today so many people, when you think of races, tend to think of inferior and superior races, some that are lower than others. And friends, I believe all of us even have been indoctrinated in some way in regard to that sort of teaching. People before us aren't as good as us and things like that. We, I, I think it's about time the church abandoned the term races and started to use terms like people groups or something like that. And we should be out there telling the world there is only one race anyway. We're all descendants of Adam. Remember a man who told me after listening to one of these lectures, he said, when I went home and filled out my census form, he said, when it said, what race are you? I put down Adams. <laughs> And I thought, <laughs> I thought to myself, can you imagine some federal government public servant looking at that census form and saying, hey, has anybody heard of this Adams race? <laughs> well, of course, a long time ago, everyone heard of Adams race, didn't they? You know the sad thing to me? The church is not leading the way in regard to the issues of racism because just like it did with the millions of years, it also adopted the secular worldview into the Bible. And now, because it's politically incorrect to talk about some of these things the way that they have been, now the world is changing their mind and the, and the church is left behind because it accommodated to the world in the first place. You see, that's what's happened over and over again in the church. On the ABC News science page, in regard to some of the research that had been done on humans, they said this, more and more scientists find the differences that set us apart are cultural, not racial. Some even say the word race should be abandoned because it's meaningless. Why hasn't the church been out there saying this? Why haven't we been leading the way? But no, we're infiltrated by outside ideas. That's, that's the problem. In fact, that's why I like the term in Acts chapter 17, God made of one blood. We're all related. We all go back to Adam and Eve. And that's why when I look at any one of you here, you know, I've tried to train myself, and you'll see as we go through this in a moment, not to look at, at little minor external features, but to program myself to start looking at who the real person is, not just some external feature that some people have been taught uh, to look at more than others. And, and we'll talk about that. You see, how many of you were taught like I was taught that there are main racial groups, like we read in that particular, that particular quote from the textbook in the Scopes trial days,